Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are we this morning? Up and Adam. We're moving. Lucy, did you say moving? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I got my COVID shot a couple days ago and it I'm not sick like a lot of people, but I'm moving slowly today. Very slowly. Yeah. Yay. I'm going to be eating breakfast. <laughs> it's all good. I haven't had time. I'll tempt you, no. Because it's like, what, 8.30 where you are? <clears throat> no, is it 9.30? I'm in Missouri, so you're on Central Time. No, you're on Eastern no, Time in I'm Ohio, on Eastern. aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're on Central Time. Jerome, I've been thinking about your wife. How is she doing and how are you doing? You are on me. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> She came through everything wonderfully. Um, uh, the surgeon, when they talked to me, they said um, everything, nothing could have gone any better as planned. Um, so we're looking at, uh, we went, we did have to go down again yesterday. We're about an hour and 15 minutes from our, our hospital. So uh, we had to go down yesterday. She was getting a little heavy in one side. They thought they were gonna have to do some draining, but, um, she said, we're going to, we're going to hold off on it. Come back Tuesday. So outside of that, we haven't had any, any hiccups. Everything's gone really well. Actually the day after her surgery, she went to Walmart, IV, all these, she was feeling great. So we've really been blessed. I think she might've overdone it a little bit, but she didn't. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. She it wouldn't tell you if she did. Yeah. <laughs> Good night. Hello, Ashley, you made it. Ashley has a young one with her. She does. I do. She oh, there she is. <laughs> this is our youth pastor's daughter. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, this is our youth pastor. Yes. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> what is her name? Emma Kate. Hi, Emma Kate. Hi, Emma. Welcome. <laughs> Say hi. Don't be shy. We just She's woke up. So. <laughs> How fun. Ashley's on a youth retreat. Oh, awesome. <laughs> That's okay, Ashley. Dr. Chris just said, I'm eating breakfast, if you don't mind, and then held up a bowl of cereal. So it's all good. <laughs> oh, good. actually, it's, it's sausage with berries. Ah. Good. Yes. You know, I don't like milk. I have never, well, since probably first grade, I do not like milk. So eating cereal is impossible for me. And when I was, when I had my children, I was at a, um, a public hospital, Grady Hospital in Atlanta, and you didn't get to choose your food. So uh, you ate whatever they brought you. And being uh, in Atlanta, you got grits, which I wasn't really crazy about. And so every morning they brought you grits, eggs. I don't like eggs unless they're in cake and things like that. And um, cereal with milk. And you got orange juice. So I learned to eat cereal with orange juice. And then I would hide the rest of it and not, not eat it. Yeah, no. Mm -mm. It was very difficult. But if you were there on Sunday and I was with two of them, then you got either pancakes or waffles and that was nice. <laughs> Sounds like Southern food all the way around. Yes, indeedy. There's a lot of good Southern food, yeah. Good old beans. On a bright note, my wife has given me a day of reprieve today. Um, the mushrooms are up here in West Central Illinois, so I'm going to hit the woods, get a little time with the Lord, a little reboot time, uh, all the way around time, and hopefully even bring home something to eat. Nice. Are those the morel? Yes. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Oh, they're Quite so delicious. 
Uh, yes, I'm surprised my son hasn't gone morel hide hunting. He usually does, but not this year. Yeah, it's just really getting hitting the prime time. And it's not very long. It's only a few weeks, right? Three or yep. four weeks at less, uh, lucky. Yeah, if if you're lucky. The way this year's patterned out, people just started finding them a few days ago, and if it gets up in the 80s a few days, it won't last but about two weeks. Usually wow. by the usually by the 10th of May here in West Central Illinois, we're done. We're in the 80s today. We were yesterday too. Okay, so what do you all have have going? There's Jeff. Anything from this week? I think this has been a very interesting class and I'm going to like raise my hand here and say I was a little bit intimidated when this class first started about like, what are we getting into? And <laughs> are you gonna mess with my understanding of the Bible and I'm not gonna like this. And it's really been helpful to go through this and really think about what you're reading. I think a lot of times we just read and not really think about what's going on in these, and you know, that this is a letter and, you know, Paul is talking to this specific church and what is the community like in this church? And, you know, it really helped going and learning some of the history of, okay, so this is what Corneth was like. And this was the culture of Corneth and, you know, yeah, maybe Paul is giving some advice specific to that culture, but there might be other things happening in other churches that we just haven't like told Paul about that we're going, okay, we can glean some wisdom from this. And seeing, you know, reading it through a Judaic lens, mm. going, wait a minute, these people were Jewish at this point. You know, and we're, we're having problems with, okay, we're accepting the Gentiles and realizing this is a very radical sect of Judaism that says, hey, we're going to like open arms to the Gentiles. And that really changed my perspective because we tend to read this from, you know, from a Christian standpoint versus these are Jewish people that have trying to figure out this encounter of what they believe of God, a new encounter of God. And it's confusing. You've already got the Sadducees and the Pharisees going at each other's throats. Yes. <laughs> then, then you have this new sect comes up that's claiming that Jesus is the Messiah and the Messiah has come. And this is a spiritual rebirth, not a political one where the other groups are like, no, we're waiting for a political Messiah. He's going to do the same thing that Moses did and really sitting down and going, yeah, this is complicated. And I really have not been doing these documents justice of really sitting down and really thinking about what's going on here. And then really going, okay, I can see how faith in Christianity is hard. We really don't have much. Yeah. Really sitting down, you know, always going, you know, the New Testament is thin. But then really going and saying, the New Testament is really thin. There, you know, compared to the Hebrew scriptures going, oh my gosh, what the heck? <laughs> and seeing that, okay, this really changed my perspective. It really made me say, I have to sit down and really think about this. And not just say, you know, we're coming from the other side of these events where, you know, we, we've been through where, you know, J Judaism, you know, reading Revelation and going, wait a minute, we're talking about after the temple has been destroyed. And, you know, now we're calling Rome Babylon because that reminded us of Babylon and going, this is still very Jewish. And going, you know, how we say okay well this talks about the end times and I'm thinking well I'm sure the Jews probably thought it was the end time going through the holocaust too and really sitting down and thinking about you know if I really put myself in their position that you know we're the low low lowest class of Roman society and you know 
in the beginning, it's just a fight between the Jews. And then it spreads and now it becomes, it's now affecting Roman life. <laughs> and the Romans, are, the Romans are going, okay, this was okay when you guys just fought amongst yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> now you're bringing your ish over into our clan and we don't really know how to deal with this. It really changed my perspective on like the whole New Testament and sitting down going, yeah, you know, I really need to think more about this, especially with us just having Easter and really sitting down and watching our, my Easter celebration and going, huh, and really thinking about, you know, this is, we're reading about early Christianity, very early Christianity, which it wasn't even Christianity at that point. Right, exactly. And, and then going, well, look, let's see what we've made it into over, you know, the centuries and how we interpret what happened. And it was kind of just sitting there going, huh, and going, you know, I, you know, I'm sure most people in our pews don't think about this stuff. And then going, okay, so as a church leader, how do you convey this and saying, you know, if you've never been a part of a startup movement or you've never worked at a startup company and you know how chaotic it is in the early days when you're trying to figure things out, you're just running with this great idea and, you know, and there's all sorts of opinions on what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And most of our people in our pews have never had that experience. So it really made me sit down and go, I really like me to kind of rethink all of this, you know, and not saying I don't believe in the Messiah because obviously they believed in the Messiah too, but it really made me think, so what exactly is our Messiah today? <laughs> so it, it, it's been a really good experience and I'm still kind of like pondering like, so maybe we should be posing that to the people in the views. You know, who, who do you, what do you believe the Messiah is supposed to be? You know, because obviously people back then had different opinions and I'm pretty sure there's probably different opinions in my pews and I just don't know about it. Yeah, so one of the things you'll have to do if you ask people in the pews is define Messiah. You know, there are all these, these different layers to that. Um, we talk in terms of Messiah or the Christ and, and those are theological thoughts or constructs, right? So that then it's Jesus who is, it's Jesus who's here, it's Christ who's up here or the Messiah, Messiah being, well, Christ too, you know, what's um, promised. I think, you know, Messiah is promised and uh, Christ is what appears, uh, who appeared, and it's still up here, and Jesus is the person who was there and is still with us um, in this way. I have, uh, she's a disciples, a retired disciples minister, and I keep asking her, why on earth are you still wanting to be a minister? I don't get it, um, because she can talk about the Christ and still wipe them out you know, maybe he was this, maybe he was that, but that's pretty much irrelevant um, uh, for her. When, you know, pick up, it's kind of parallel to what you're saying, um, Lucy, uh, when we started our church, and I was writing this, and then I, I took it back out, when we started the church, it was The Rock up there in um, Metro Seattle, um, just amazing things were happening and we didn't have explanation except it was the Holy Spirit and there were ways that you started churches and they you know you were supposed to fit this box and we were working with Bill Ezum uh, we were part of an experiment and part of the experiment was that we would not take money uh, from our denomination because our den and there were a, I don't know, two or three denominations represented amongst the, the um, what ended up to be, I think, eight. And we started with four. We were United Methodist and Disciples in the four. And so he said, uh, do not, uh, you, you can't take money to be part of this. Ex well, no, you can't take money to be part of this experiment uh, because I don't want you beholden to what 
your denomination will say because of the boxes. And so you know, we did that and, and we went uh, to, to what was then the Northwest region. And we, uh, we kept getting, we, they kept asking us this question, like, how, do, how does that work? I don't know. And, uh, you know, to have elders, elders, you have to be a member of the church often for so long. My home church, to be an elder, you had to be a member of that church for seven years or longer. They really wanted to know you and know you're deep. Yeah. And uh, to be a deacon, I think it was three years. I don't think it was five. It was three years. And fortunately, we're, we were growing and we had people there so that that allowed for us, but we didn't have anything. You know, we started this church and when we were a parachute drop, the only people we knew <laughs> were the um, few people, the chair of the, um, uh, what would have been commission on church development and the vice chair and the commission, uh, the chair, he left. And then there was a minister who, um, who made a formal complaint against us because we had covenants and our covenants were just to be in leadership that you, you know, you worship daily, attend worship services. You know, those were, if you want to be in leadership, that's, that's the way it is. Well, what about, do you have to have covenants to be a member? Well, we're not really counting members. You know, if you say our church, then we figure you're a member, um, you're, you're in. Uh, and that was just anathema to a couple of them. And, and so, but we had stories every week, there were stories and we're trying to figure out these these structures and these pieces and over and over again, I'd say, I don't know, you know, I really don't know what I know is what's happening. And we're trying to put that together in some way. Um, and, you know, you're not disciples. Well, actually, we are disciples ordained uh, standing has been in three, three um, in good standing in three regions. Yeah, I think we're disciples. But hey, remove our, our, our ordination, our standing. Go ahead, it, whatever. Um, you don't want another church? That's okay. Uh, yeah, so it, I, I, for me, I can reflect back on these pieces from that, that perspective. Um, yeah, yeah. And the world is moving and they're seeing miracles. And that's the other part. They're just seeing this incredible movement of the spirit. And I mean, if you didn't know Jesus and see those pieces happening, um, why, what is going on? Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Jerome, I see that. Yes. Yes. Um, there's a book that I read. It's by Alfred Edersheim. Um, this kind of goes along with what, what Lucy was saying. Uh, the, Happen, happen to understand the Jewish faith in order to really understand the New Testament. Um, it's called The Temple, Its Ministry, and Its Services. Um, it is some of the most dry reading you'll ever find. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to try to joke with you, but I mean, when you get into some of the stuff, even in Revelations, you know, when they talk about talk about the emerald and stuff, and if you don't understand that in Jewish culture, you know, that, that an emerald signified marriage as a diamond does for us it clarifies that book clarifies a lot of this stuff about how the jewish uh, how the jewish religion function in that time and it really can bring to life a lot of the things in the new testament and i mean it it's a really boring book but it can really bring a lot of life to the bible i guess i'll put it that way but it, it was a really valuable resource Here's yeah, like, like, like Lucy was saying, you know, the whole thing about this, this course that's really stood out to me is how little I was paying attention to an entire book. Um, I was paying so much more attention to individual scripture. I mean, I thought somewhat that was the case when we started. And the further we get, the more I realized that was almost the entire case. And, you know, to to not even really get the full grasp of it. I just wanted to find what was going to be of value to the particular topic that I was researching. And I, I mean, that's really, that's really changed over the past few weeks. And I appreciate that. One of my mentees, a uh, team taught with his lay leader, the book of revelation in four weeks. 
And I just kind of giggled and asked, you know, okay, what is your, where, where are you heading with this? What are you doing with that? And he doesn't have the background, neither does his, um, uh, his lay leader, chair of his board. And they were doing just that, Jerome, just taking slices and pieces of, of chapters and putting some themes in there uh, and not taking in its, its totality, which brings something different to us. Um, totally, totally different. How does that come together? How does that fit with Genesis? How does that fit with the prophets? Where, you, what, where is all of this? And what does that say to us today? What's, if the Bible's the living word and it still speaks today, what the heck is it saying? Amen. Yeah. Um, I just, I just ordered this book. I have it on my Kindle and I haven't read it yet. It's called After Jesus Before Christianity. Mm. And I thought that, that would be, that'll be a good read. Yeah. To me, it made me want to actually go. Wait a minute, Lucy, I can't hear you. Your mic oh. is on, but I'm not hearing. There you go. It just faded okay. out for some reason. That um, it made me, you know, really starting to dig into this and going, okay, well, I see pieces of the Apostles' Creed in here, you know, like it's infancy state. And really thinking about, because we kind of skip over that going like those 300 years, we skip over all that and go, okay, so, you know, they had the, the Council of Nicaea and <laughs> here, here, here's, here's the Apostles' Creed. And we don't sit down and really say, you know what, that stuff still exists where they're still in this period where they're, fig they're figuring it out and they're still debating on what this is, you know, and finally, you know, the, the, the general information that I know where basically the kings, you know, got tired of them all squabbling and said, look, we're going to have a council here. We, we've, we've got to hash this out. And, you know, the same thing happened in the Reformation that, you know, we have a break from Roman Catholicism. And again, there's all these theories about, so how do we reform the church? Well, maybe we should do it this way and we should do it that way. And realistically, um, the king of whatever, or prince of whatever territory you were was like, look, you guys need to figure it out. You know, again, we're gonna call a council and we're going to figure this out. And, you know, you come to America where we don't have that in place where, you know, there's, if it's going to be an ecclesiastic council, it's us. We have to do it. You know, there's not going to be a political person sitting down and saying, look, you people are a mess, a hot mess, and you need to figure this out. So it really say, okay, so what were there, those early arguments that are not included in the Bible? Um, because, you know, they're, they're not witnesses of Christ. These are second, third generation people right. that are still trying to hash this out. And, you know, that repeated again, you know, because the Catholic church was a mess in the middle, middle, middle ages. And, you know, people get are going, okay, so how do we figure this out? So, it really impressed upon me that this has always been hard, that how do you, you know, Jesus is divine and also is human. Okay, that just is really hard to wrap your mind around and that we're not alone in trying to figure this out, that this is not our first rodeo. It kind of gave me a little bit of comfort mm. to read these letters and go, you know what, here's Paul trying to explain the best that he knows how in human language how this works and people aren't getting it and some do some don't <laughs> and um you know we have this 300 year period before Constantine comes on the scene and there's all different ideas floating around and then Constantine goes look we need to figure this out <laughs> then we go to the reformation and you have poor Martin Luther going okay we've gotten off track here people and, you know, and we don't go back and even read the stuff where Luther's talking to the Catholic Church. And it's fascinating because, you know, we're 500 years later and we kind of have kind of like Paul, 
you know, kind of lifted up Martin Luther to this pedestal, but we don't go back and read his actual writings where originally he was just trying to reform the church. It blows up and, <laughs> and then other people start putting their input into it. And then the princes have to come down and basically kind of stomp on people and go, look, you need to get your act together. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that really helped me to say, okay, you know, when you're talking to a non-Christian <laughs> and really thinking about this and going, you know, maybe I need to talk to a person and say, okay, yeah, we've kind of had this problem. Let, let, me, let me explain to you, you know, how we've kind of gotten to this point. It is confusing. Um, you know, how do you see, wh where's Jesus in all this mess? <laughs> and I think, being more realistic about our story, really looking at, okay, the early, the very early church, even within Judaism, there's conflict. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's not this beautiful pie in the sky picture. There's a lot of conflict and, you know, you have uh, sects that kind of go off into their own territory and develop into something else. And this is tough. We're trying to explain the unexplainable, right? That you, you know, yeah. Um, I think I said this, one of my former sponsees, no, she was my sponsor actually, who said, um, you know, my, my love language is touch. So how do I, how do I, understand or relate to this thing you talk about this Jesus you talk about who loves me and yet I can't experience that love because because it's touch right and what ended up happening um was I I'm a I am a registered Reiki master teacher in the state of Washington it's the only state that will register Reiki teachers. And, um, and the only school, vocational school of Reiki is, is up there. They require like 160 hours to be a teacher. And, um, and so I had gone through that. Actually, I was going through it and she agreed to, to have Reiki. And so Reiki is, um, it's, a, um, it's an, a healing modality out of Japan, and uh, you you can place hands on, uh, and the person's fully clothed. But what you're doing, you're trained to feel energy, on, and it sounds really ridiculous and crazy. I mean, this is all part of that, but it's real. I'm telling you, it is real stuff. And um, and so I said to her, and I said, "Well, I." would you be open to, you know, to, you know, doing something with Reiki? Uh, Cause when I do it, I always pray. That's how I go into it is I ask Jesus to do whatever he needs to do through my hands and, um, and, you know, healing and whatnot. So um, I did that with her and I, and I, I, I always start like under the shoulders. So um, I'll put my hands under their shoulders if, if that works for them. And, um, and Marcia said, soccer game is starting. Have a good time. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, bye. Yeah. Um, and yes, so, and Jerome, thank you for putting that up in the chat too. Um, so yeah, so no sooner had I put my hands underneath her shoulders and she started to cry and then she started sobbing. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. You know what, nobody warned me that this is what happens. And so I just kept saying, Jesus, what am I supposed to do? And he said, just, just stay there. And so I did that. And when she started to not cry some more, then I started to, you know, move around. And um, when we were finished, she said, oh my gosh, I felt Jesus. She said, I felt this overwhelming sense of love. 
do you think that could have been Jesus? And I said, I guarantee you that that was Jesus. And um, it turned out that she had been abused as um, a young child and she was uh, beaten. And a lot of that beating came in the upper part of her body. And so she arranged, um, she told her therapist about the experience and her therapist said, what if you went and had Reiki before your sessions and see, you know, what might come up and then we could process that. And so that's what we did for the longest time. And since then, I've had people say to me, and part of with Reiki, people say about, um, it's meant really is a part of it is calming and rest. And there's a healing aspect to that, but sometimes the healing is just lessening anxiety or a friend of mine would call me at eight or nine o'clock at night. She was a district superintendent and she'd say, oh my gosh, can I just come over? And um, I really need this. And she would come over and then she would fall asleep. <laughs> she would just lay on, you use a massage table and she would just lay on my table and sleep. And we've had people fall asleep um, other times as well. But, um, you know, people will say, oh my gosh, I, I experienced Jesus or I felt Jesus. And um, I don't go in there saying, well, you're going to, this is what you're going to experience. And Jesus might touch you. I don't even mention Jesus, except to say, um, you need to know, especially if they, they have done other Reiki with a non-Christian, I'd say, you know, I go into this from Jesus and um, being the tangible touch of Jesus. Yeah. So those experiences, right? Now, how are we experienced? How are we bringing Jesus to people in a way that, that they understand? You Jeff, know what? Oh, oh Lucy. sorry. Je no, Je Jeff Je is unmuted. I know you, you stay unmuted. Do you have, to, you usually have things to, to share and chime in. I'm wondering, wisdom. Uh-oh, is Jeff frozen? Oh, <laughs> it's still early. <laughs> it's still early. <laughs> yeah, he's at what nine o'clock, seven, seven o'clock there. Oh, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> Sleeping with my eyes open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to see if you had anything you wanted to say or or add to our conversation. Mm. I, I'm not sure. I've got, you know, it's like, I, I don't want to go on to a, into a book. There's lots of things I've been thinking about a lot lately. New thoughts, new ideas, old stuff. Um, one of the things that's been kind of percolating to the top for me as we've been going through the last few weeks is uh, kind of a reintroduction on all of the cyclic nature of everything that we see happening from the first chapter of the Old Testament when we make our way through Genesis all the way to Revelation. You know, it seems like the, the entire library um, is a cycle and then each book has a cycle. And, you know, it's all about, you know, we're okay uh, if we're connected with God and where we mess up is when we decide to go our own way. So part of what I've been thinking about is um, the danger, or not the danger, the risk, the vulnerability we have in our culture of needing to be in control, uh, needing to have the answers, needing to create stuff on our own and then take ownership of it. And um, part of what I've experienced in the last few months with people in conversations about the Bible has been um, kind of like folks going off in their own directions where it seems like they'd like to create their own um, council of 2022. And, you know, I kind of look at that and some of the folks that I work with here and say, you know, in a period of 24 hours, mm -hmm. from the moment you're awake to the moment you go to sleep, you have a finite uh, time resource of things that you can do. 
And when you reflect upon what's going on the last day, um, how well were you doing in um, following the way, the truth, and the life of Christ and manifesting the fruits of the Spirit? And how much of that was spent diving into the user's manual of life mm -hmm. and not applying it? And what's got me thinking in that direction is so many of these folks that I've talked to that say things about, well, I didn't, I don't agree with Peter. I don't agree with Paul. I don't agree with the decisions they made when they created the new international version of the Bible. I mean, it gets, it's an endless list and it gets back again to, you know, not, not personally taking it this direction, but you know, my observation of what I see you doing in your life right now is that you're hurting a lot of people through what you're saying and doing. Mm. You're spending a lot of time diving into the Bible. You're critiquing the Bible and saying what you like out of it, what you don't. And in fact, in many occasions, you're saying you'd like a different menu, please. Mm. But you're not manifesting the fruits of the spirit. What do we need to do to pragmatically apply what's in the Bible instead of trying to change it. So that, that's it in a nutshell. You know, it's so much more complicated than that. But um, I'm, I'm facilitating a Bible study right now and the adults coming together, it's, it's been amazing. It's wonderful. They come from a very eclectic, broad spectrum of different denominational backgrounds and different um, educational backgrounds. And uh, uh, the discussions have been wonderful. And in general, one of the common themes that's coming forth is uh, one of the oldest ladies, one of our matriarchs here at the church is, how could we possibly do this on our own? Mm -hmm. There's so much we're learning about contextual relevance and what was going on politically at the time. And that uh, for example, when women weren't allowed to do this or that, that that was a specific time in a specific period for a specific group of people, and it just as well could apply to a group of men causing trouble today, too. So it's, it's, that's been nice. <laughs> yeah. um, where was I going to go say about that? Um, I just did the contextualization. Study the Bible. I don't know. I may get there in a moment. Um, about doing the studies, uh, I was a baby Christian, just a baby Christian, and um, and I. But I was working in this in the church as a secretary, and the man who did our it was Reese. Out of all of these years, Reese Heating and Air uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, was our servicer. We had one of those big, gigantic old furnaces. It was an old, old church. Anyways, Mr. Reese came and we got into this conversation about communion. And as a Methodist, we had communion once a month and, uh, and whatnot. And he was, we were talking about whether, whether we used grape juice or wine. Well, in the United Methodist Church, at least at that time, there was no drinking policy. Ministers were not allowed to have alcohol. And, um, and I said, well, oh my gosh, you know, John Wesley was, uh, was against alcohol and that would be wine. So we have grape juice. And he said something about, well, uh, that was right. And I said, well, how do you, that's what the Bible says. I said, how do you know that? Where is that? He said, well, the word in Greek, the word for uh, wine is, um, means unfermented wine. And I said, or un, yeah, unfermented wine. And I said, it does? And he goes, yes. I said, well, how do you know that? Do you know Greek? And he goes, and I was serious. I wasn't being ugly. And he said, my pastor told me. So when I went to college, I figured if I'm going to be a minister, I need to know Greek. So I took the introduction to Greek and that was a year and it took me five and a half years to graduate. And so I ended up with five years of Greek uh, under my belt and a second major. Uh, and I never got to see Mr. Reese again, but I, I, uh, I would like to in some way. And my guess is he's long passed on um, because no, 
the word for wine is wine. So that that was not that was not the case uh, at all. But we do we study and right we go with what we're told and we yeah. pull up. So many of us do our sermon study out of you know the books. Will Williman uh, is one of those that provides. Uh, sermons every month, every quarter, uh, sermon hints, background information. I have in boxes currently, but um, shelves of commentaries and uh, sermon prep materials and, and all of this stuff. And, you know, you just think, oh my gosh, and I haven't used them for years because there's all this stuff that's, that's there. And even, I mean, this is, I think, the fourth time I've taught this class, it could be fifth time. And I learn something new and different every, mm -hmm. every class period. The, I remember, Jeff, what I was gonna say uh, as you were talking, I got to teach um, world religions once <laughs> and uh, the professor Clem uh, had had a massive stroke. And so uh, they needed somebody to pinch hit on two weeks notice. And so I, I stepped in. I have no business teaching world religions. So I used the textbook he had and I, I looked at the syllabus and it was not making total sense to me. So what we did was every week we did another religion, another one of the religions we were gonna cover and picking out you know the good positive pieces in those and you know the importance, what, what was the background to them? How are they being practiced today, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and what I found after the first week was people were, his students were going, wow, I really like that. I want to, I want to practice that. And it, it, every week there was something. And so finally I started to say, okay, so what does that say to you as a Christian? You know, how would you integrate that? And the final became, uh, here are different parts of religions, um, pieces of religions. And I want you to have a chart and for each religion, fill in those pieces. And the final part of that is to say why you're a Christian. You know, I, you really like this. You really like that. That that was cool. It wasn't just about the practices. It was about the thoughts, the theology of it all. But why are you a Christian? So it became an apologetic, uh, right? An apologetic is, if you will, a defense of our religion. It's explaining uh, why we believe what we do. And so, you know, there it was. Why are you why are you a Christian? Explain. And they did a good job, I have to say. A really good job. Always, yeah, we like to, and Christianity is that too. In in uh, early Christianity, it was recognizing what was there and, and kind of bringing it in, uh, whether they wanted to or not. Celtic Christianity has uh, informed us. Um, and uh, is grounded in St. Pat Patrick, who probably couldn't be more Christian than, than anybody, but he used the piece, uh, you know, the, the three leaf clovers to explain the Trinity, right, uh, to bring that home. So that's a piece for us to learn from, you know, who are the people that we, uh, with whom we're working, who um, are the people that, you know, we try to reach, I don't like that language currently because it's like, oh, I'm trying to reach somebody here. Like, who's in your little area, right? Who, who could you be having conversations with? And then how will you have those conversations? It's not to just force a conversation, but, but looking for those little opportunities. And that was the other thing. And I know I'm taking the last, last words here. Um, if you haven't had my husband's evangelism class, he does something called the five faces of Jesus in there. And so what he does, he talks about five very specific faces, but the faces are, you can have any number of faces and, and which one you identify uh, most with. I forget, he kept saying, I, I resonated with somebody. And I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> I'm, you know, I resonate with um, the Samaritan woman, to be quite honest with you. I think I really don't remember who he was saying. I was like, no, no, no. And here's why. So um, you have that face, that 
that part of him that with whom you resonate that matches your story in in a way and then you're listening for people who have a similar story that you can then tell them that story um uh, maybe not saying it's in the bible but making those touch points and looking for the opportunity to do that within within the bible and another question i love to ask my um spiritual uh, spiritual directees and my clients uh who are christians is um so what story are you are you feeling like this week or um who who in the bible are you connecting with this week like tell me who that is so i can know you uh, you know learn a little bit better where where you are and it's fun it's fun to to do it catches you off guard until you've been with me for a while uh but it, I, again putting ourselves back in there and how does that speak to us today because we are people of the book and those of us on here um that are disciples hopefully you've heard that um i know lucy I, you may not have heard that as a non-disciples but we talk about uh from our very beginnings we are people of the book and often i've like thumped the bible on a pulpit and said which book are you reading you know i'm like are you reading Harley Quinn romances? You're, you know, you're on you know, Louis L'Amour and all this, this other stuff. Like, but this is the book. Uh, so if we stand on that foundation, which I'm sorry, no, I'm not sorry. We are supposed to be. We have to be. We should be. We need to be. Um, then how how are we relating to it and allow it allowing us uh, to speak to us right now? So I'm going to leave you with that question. Who, who are you uh, feeling like um, this week? What, um, I don't want to call them characters, what person uh, in scripture, not necessarily just New Testament, um, maybe Old Testament right now. And what story does that tell? I'll put that in as a question this week. Aha, uh -huh, you're warned. <laughs> Can I pray for us? And we'll go, yeah. Jesus, I thank you that you are the word. And God, I thank you that um, in the beginning you were, you spoke, you spoke the word that you've given us all of these opportunities to meet you and to know you. And um, we have to confess that we, <laughs> we ignore you. Uh, we've chosen to go in other directions. We don't, um, even, even when we think of you, we, um, we're falling short on helping other people to think about you. We miss the opportunities to make introductions uh, to you. And Lord, just um, Jesus, pop into uh, uh, our lives in ways that we can see you this week and that we can see you in other people's lives. Give us opportunities to have divine conversation, whether it's um, direct or indirect, even if it's um, not uh, mentioning anybody or anything in the Bible directly, but continue to enlighten us in ways that aren't intellectual, but are um, are real and tangible and uh, su sunk into our spirit or sinking into our spirit so that we can be completely integrated with um, not only your word, but with you. Thank you for the good news from Jerome about his wife. Again, thank you uh, for this opportunity to be with you and to, to learn. We're giving you this day show us uh, yourself in, no, 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 open our eyes in a huge way that we can see you uh, new and um, enjoy you uh, tomorrow in our worship services. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Real I will quick. See you. Have a great Russia day. Russia in her her, her thing said she's having surgery Tuesday. Oh, good. Yes. Thank and you. she wanted to pray a prayer. So uh, don't forget about Marsha. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, for all to go very well for um, 
yeah, Jesus, thank you for being our great physician. We thank you again. Um, use her doctors, her technicians, nurses, everybody who has anything to do uh, with this surgery. Um, uh, just flow through them, guide their hands, guide their thinking, and, um, and uh, yeah, hasten her healing. Um, and we'll continue to give you thanks and use this as an opportunity to share your thanks with others, to share our thanks with others. Amen. Yeah, so we won't see Marsha at all, or if we do, it won't be very much this, this week. I just keep holding her. Thank you, Lucy, for the reminder. This is why I'm not a pastor. I don't remember those things. Yeah. My administrative assistant or administrator used to have to remind me and that people were in the hospital and I needed to go see them. And my first response to learning that somebody in the, was in the hospital, like one of the ministers I had was, pardon my French, oh shit. Now, you mean I have to go see them? And then I would forget. And after a couple of days, she would call me and say, have you gone to see them? I'd say, uh, no. She'd say, okay, I put it on your calendar and you have five alarms. You've got to go see them. And by the fifth alarm, you know, I just keep going. And then she would call me and she'd say, okay, you're in Columbia? I say, yeah. She goes, we're not hanging up until you're in that hospital. And then she would guide me there. So I'm the worst. I really am the worst pastor. I have other gifts. That's not one. Okay. Thank you. Hugs to you all. Bye. Bye.